The next two speakers are going to talk about the materials, the biomass that Blake wants to deconstruct, and the focus of the Department of Energy on uh, non-food biomass has really spawned a, uh, you know, a blooming of, of insights into grasses and trees, and fundamental insights that will be relevant for food crops also. But, and so uh, Sean Kepler from the Department of Agronomy University of Wisconsin has, which is part of the uh, Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center, which is centered at Wisconsin, has been studying grasses and has derived lots of very interesting insights from natural variation. So he'll be talking about analysis of natural variation for biofuel traits in grasses. Thank you. Well, if Blake doesn't like corn, he won't like my talk. <laughs> Um, I'm here representing the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. I'm not going to discuss the whole center, but uh, just focus a little bit on some of our work on crops. We do work on corn and switchgrass. I'm going to talk more about maize today than switchgrass, but we're using a lot of similar technologies and approaches um, as we study these species and all with the goal of trying to improve the productivity and the um, recalcitrance of those crops for biofuel production. Um, maize is an important species for us because of its relationship to other biofuel species, uh, including sorghum, switchgrass, miscanthus, and so it's one of the reasons that we focus, focus on it. And maize also has great potential as a dual purpose crop. So of course uh, there's the fuel versus, uh, feed versus fuel argument. If you can harvest the grain from a field and at the same time harvest the stover, you get a dual benefit, and especially in times of low uh, grain prices like this, it becomes more and more attractive to the farmer to be able to do this. In 2014, there was a record yield, that average yield that was produced, 171 bushels per acre. That equates to 12 megagrams per hectare of grain biomass. There's also a record uh, yield contest winner, 503 bushels per acre. That's 35 megagrams per hectare of grain biomass. The, the uh, harvest index of corn stays about the same as you increase the yield potential, and so um, concomitant with that, uh, amount of grain yield is uh, uh, 12 megagrams per hectare of stover produced at the average grain yield and up to 35 megagrams per hectare at the maximum yield. In addition, if you take a figure like 10% of the root biomass, uh, the roots being 10% of the aerial biomass, that's another 2.4 to 7 megagrams per hectare. So you can see that there's lots of carbon that's fixed there, lots of potential, lots of things for Blake to break down with his ionic liquids. In addition, uh, maize has potential as a dual purpose crop, so I've just shown you the rapid amount of time that you accumulate this biomass. It's in about the first 75 days that the corn plant builds its architecture to support the grain production, and another 45 days or so that it doubles the biomass. Um, but in addition, we realized towards the end of the season there's still some photosynthate available, and, and uh, in keeping with the ideas of the center and the goals of the center, um, we believe that it, if we add a vegetative sink, for instance, uh, adding vegetative oils or some sort of storage carbohydrates, there's the potential to increase the density and the yield of that biomass even further, that non-grain biomass, by having a sink for that uh, carbohydrate to grow at the end of the season. So a lot of this work that we've done has been in the context of maize diversity. Um, while you're watching the plants grow, there's two seeds each of three different inbreds there, and you can see even at this very early stage, there's tremendous diversity for the growth rate and growth patterns of these different inbreds. I'll also highlight here on the left-hand side is B73, that's the reference inbred, and the right-hand side is PH207, which is another inbred line that we sequenced recently, and so those will show up again as I continue with this talk. So some of the tools then, the use of sequencing, and this is where JGI has been very important for us, um, we've gathered a lot of data across different um, strains of corn, um, and I'm going to mention here several sets of data that, that we've used in this process. So uh, first we sequenced, uh, using RNA-Seq, 503 inbred lines of maize and used this to assess diversity. A subset of those were resequenced um, to a depth of 10 to 20x. And then uh, more recently we've contributed to the assembly of, of uh, another inbred line, the second maize reference, PH207. In addition, I'm not going to talk about it too in this talk today, but we've also been using exome capture um, substantially in switchgrass and also in, in corn, and exome capture has been very useful in terms of uh, 
identifying SNPs, but also giving information on presence, absence variation, and copy number variation in a way that other technologies uh, aren't able to. So I'm going to first talk about our RNA sequencing study. Um, we were interested in looking at the expression and also getting uh, SNP information. When we did this RNA sequencing, we used whole seedlings, whole maize seedlings, because about 80,000 or 80% 80 of the genes are expressed in seedlings. So that was a very rich tissue for our expression analysis. And of course, it's easy to harvest in a, in a uniform way. Um, we sampled the whole seedlings, about 20 million RNA-seq reads per genotype. And then when we explored the sequences, we noticed that a number of the sequences didn't align to the B73 genome. And there was information before that there's presence, absence, and copy number variation in corn, but this gave us a handle into the uh, looking at, at that variation using this uh, sequence resource. Um, so we took all of the sequences that didn't map to B73 and assembled those and, uh, and, and used those to get an insight into the pan genome of corn. Later on, at the end of this talk, I have just a few slides where we've also generated SNP data sets and used that for genome-wide association analysis. So with the RNA-seq reads, then, we have um, the dispensable genes that are present in the genome. We, like I said, assembled all these reads from all the different inbred lines. On average, there's 2,000 assemblies that are not present in the re reference genome in each inbred that's um, gathered. And when we contact those assemblies together and looked at the overlap of those assemblies, there's 20,000 maize genes that are not present in the reference genome as we look across this set. And you can see that peak leveling off, the red peak leap leveling off, so we think we're approaching saturation of those missing, uh, missing genes. Um, in context, there's about 40 to 45,000 annotated maize genes, so this is a substantial number of genes that are present in one inbred and absent in another. Um, we were able to look at the position of those throughout the genome. We could use LD mapping to look at the position of each of those, and basically this uh, result showed that they're scattered throughout the genome. So they're not localized necessarily near the centromere, they're not localized within one region, but they're spread across the genome. Now there's some difficulties in interpreting the RNA-seq data, and so that's where it became useful to have a second maze assembly. On this slide, we just show the relationship from a 2006 paper of B73, the first reference to lines that have been protected by companies, and you can see it's present in lots of pedigrees of lines. And the uh, next genotype then that we assembled was PH207. That also is a very prominent uh, inbred line, and those cross together and make a heterotic hybrid. Um, this assembly involved about 500 gigabases of sequencing, paired end reads, um, mate pair reads, uh, and lo some long read sequence, and resulted in about 132,000 scaffolds uh, with N50 of 630 KB. So the total assembly size in B73 is about 2.3 gigabase pairs, and in PH207, about 2.1 gigabase pairs. So it's a fairly a complete assembly. There's a various number of ways that we looked at this assembly. Here's one comparison. We looked at the RNA-seq reads that would map, uh, RNA-seq reads from B73 in this case, that would map to B73, and also the RNA-seq reads that would map to PH207. And if you just focus on the light blue at the top, you can see that PH207 is at least as complete as B73 in terms of its uh, mapping. We also looked at um, core orthologous genes and, and a number of different statistics. It's quite a complete assembly um, relative to the B73 genome. So now you had two genomes that you could align to each other. And again, we looked at the question of how many presence and absence sequences are there in these two genomes. And if you look at um, sequences that are present in B73 and not present in PH207. There's over 5,000 sequences. Similarly, if you ask the reverse question, sequences present in PH207, not present in B73, you have 5,000 sequences. And even if we put some parameters around this and ask are there fragments of those genes that are in the genome, you can still there's, see there's still over 3,000 genes that are present in one inbred line that are absent in another. So this is very consistent with our previous uh, analysis that 5% of the genes that are in one inbred are absent in another inbred and, and consistent with our um, idea that there's up to 20,000 genes that are, are, are um, present and absent across the maize pan genome. Just a few quick statistics on these. If you look at the size of genotype-specific genes, they're a little bit smaller than the core genes. So on the left, you have B73. On the right, you have PH207. But 
slightly smaller but still reasonably sized um, gene models. And when we looked at the expression of these, we used the RNA-seq based gene atlas that we had developed. Um, it has 80 tissues from germination to senescence, all different organs throughout the plant, um, replicated samples from reference B73. And when we looked at the dispensable, the core genes first, you saw that many of these genes, over half or approximately half, were expressed in all of the tissues, and many of them were expressed in many tissues. And in sharp contrast to that, when you look at the presence-absence variants, these dispensable genes, many of them were expressed only in zero or one tissue, and only a small proportion were expressed in a large number of tissues. And on average, when you look where these genes are expressed, the dispensable genes have lower expression um, on average than the core genes. So there's something different about these genes. When you look at the annotations and so on, there's still some very good gene models in here, but uh, certainly uh, quite interesting advances that we've been able to make in, in understanding the pan genome by looking at the May sequences. So how does this relate to other species? One of the first insights we had into the pan genome, this presence absence structural variation, was looking at comparative genome hybridization. And now on the top here, we have some examples of comparative CGH uh, plots of different chromosomes. Each line is in, uh, inbred in comparison to B73. And basically across the genomes, you can see that there's lots of this presence absence variation. If you compare this to something like soybean, um, you see very little presence absence variation. And where you do see presence absence and copy number variation, structural variation, where you do see it, you see it clustered together often in clusters of disease resistance genes, for instance, and, and uh, certain regions of the genome. We only have a little bit of data on switchgrass, but I think switchgrass and many open pollinated species are going to be more like corn. Here the scale is a little bit different, but if you look across these CGH plots, you can see that there's substantial structural variation across switchgrass cr uh, chromosomes. And so I think in many cases the open pollinated species, these heterozygous species that have accumulated this variation over, over time. So just the last few slides then, like I said, our goal has been to discover genes and pathways of uh, importance for biofuel production. Uh, we're interested in productivity. We're interested in the composition of the biomass. Um, I'm going to give you one example where we looked at uh, sugar release, the potential to produce biofuels. We've also been looking at things like stalk anatomy and other traits in the crops. And all of this is in the context of sustainable cropping systems to try and understand how, which traits will benefit sustainable cropping systems. So for a GWAS, uh, here's one example. We looked at flowering time. Flowering time is an important trait uh, when we look at the overall yield of, of uh, different species. It's been very important in switchgrass in terms of getting higher yield in the north, for example. And uh, here our GWAS analysis just is uh, an example of we're finding lots of genes with this population, um, lots of candidate genes. The RNA-seq SNPs have been very useful in terms of doing this GWAS analysis. Um, and interestingly, we have taken the expression levels and also used that as a covariate instead of the markers. And this has allowed us to look for um, variants that might be outside of our SNP data set or types of variants that we can't capture in the SNP data set like presence absence variants or copy number variants. And we've identified new types of genes when we look across different traits that we didn't identify just on SNPs alone. Finally, we've, uh, as another example, we've looked at uh, recalcitrants um, using a high throughput assay. So we gather stalk cores. The stalks of corn are 60 to 70 percent of the overall biomass. It's the most recalcitrant type of biomass. And again, we've found interesting GWAS results. And now we can look at this in a couple of ways. Um, this is interesting, both in terms of what we don't see. So here's the lignin pathway. We, we know that some genes in the lignin pathway are um, help to improve sugar release in this assay, but when we look at natural variation, if you can see the red dots there, none of them are exceeding the threshold, so no evidence for uh, genes in the lignin pathway contributing to natural variation. And the most significant one is PAL, which is the first committed step in this pathway. Um, in contrast, uh, when you do look at the most significant things, we're finding new genes and new pathways that we hadn't anticipated before, and so it is a useful discovery resource. So in summary, um, the genomes, especially of open pollinated crop species, are dynamic and highly variable, and we think this variation is going to be quite important in understanding the natural phenotypic variation. Information from sequencing is providing the necessary genome infrastructure to maximize our ability to discover and understand 
um, this genome variability, and so some of the sequencing I discussed uh, just happened within the last year or so and has, has given us these insights. And the GWAS and genetic mapping are a valuable component of our research portfolio to discover and assess genes and pathways for biofuel traits. Uh, just recognize a couple people. Candy Hirsch is now at the University of Minnesota. She was at GLBRC when she did a lot of this work and is continuing with uh, some of this work. We certainly appreciate all of the um, input and resources from JGI. I've mentioned the people I've talked to the most, but I know others of you have, have been very helpful in, in our projects. And uh, Robin Buell is, is our informatics collaborator, and uh, there are several people on the PH207 consortium. And also, I want to recognize Natalia DeLeon, who's my other co-PI. So that's all I have. Thank you. <clears throat> yes? Genes that do not map uh, across the genomes you're comparing, do you know what sort of functional categories they might fall under? Um, there are a broad range of functional categories, so they're, they're not any specific uh, annotation. Uh, so we looked at Go term and Go analysis and so on, and many different types of things. A number of them, a higher proportion, are, are unannotated. Uh, so, yeah. a lot of studies on the eyeball screen. Mm -hmm. What was the approach, and have you seen the gain in um, so that specifically is a dilute acid treatment. We haven't, we haven't um, in the GWAS or in the broad diversity looked across different pretreatments. But we have provided some corn stover of different, a small number of different varieties and switchgrass varieties. And uh, have looked across several treatments for that, but I'm, I don't think there's a big genotype by treatment interaction in those cases as far as I've seen so far. Great. Well, thank you very much.